we frankly have a dysfunctional global monetary system. They now have to keep printing or we crash. We've got this ticking time bomb. Talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire. Welcome to Live from the Vault. Hi, my name is Shane Moran and I'll be your host for this week's episode of Live from the Vault, the show that goes beyond the headlines and uncovers the truth about the precious metals industry and about the effects of the global economy in these historic times. With exclusive access to experts and insiders, we reveal information and insights that you simply can't get anywhere else. Now this week we have the one and only Andrew McGuire, precious metals expert and whistleblower in the house. And to help him pull back the curtain, we'll be joined by industry expert and producer of Grid Down Power Up, Mr. David Tice. And David is the co-manager of the Precious Metals Equity Investment Management Fund. And he's also producing an important documentary on the vulnerability of the power grid. It's called Grid Down Power Up. And with that, let's head over to the UK and talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire and our special guest, David Teist. Over to you, Andy. Well, thanks, Shane, for the uh, great introduction. Um, now, with that said, David... Welcome. Um, it's such an honor to have you come back to visit us um, on your visit today. Um, the last time we had you on, um, you really, really, uh, we got so many responses. And I think there's so much we, we can talk about because there's so much you do. And my goodness me, I, I, I mean, that, it dates me a bit, but I remember I used to love watching you on CNBC appearances, um, I mean, this was when the dot com bubble was going on. Um, I think Brown's bottom hadn't even happened, and you were out there every day, and you were out there and on a regular basis, pushing back against the narrative, saying, "You know, gold. You must be buying gold." <laughs> I mean, I'm that, no one was earlier than you on calling that that. And then, of course, we all know what happened after the dot com bubble, and we all know what happened after Brown. Uh, sold the gold at 250 bucks. But thank you for coming back. And um, can we start, please, by what really got our attention last time? This was actually mind-blowing stuff to me. You shared with us a, a, a an award-winning documentary. Um, and, and I think I'd really like you to... Um, to it's called uh, Grid Down Power Up. And, and could you, for those people that haven't seen it, and obviously we're going to link it, those people that haven't seen it, this is chilling to me uh, that people don't understand this. And please, can you can you tell us maybe an overview of, of really what this film, this documentary is about? Well, first of all, thanks for the invite. Andy and I would never miss an invite with you. Look forward to breaking bread soon. We certainly have had some great history and memories. Yes. And thank kind words. So this is really a third career for me where I became a producer director of this documentary. And I founded a film company called Paul Revere Films. So I'm literally trying to wake up, you know, the American people and the British people, although this film really does apply more to Americans and it is grid down power up. And so we were lucky enough to get Dennis Quaid as our narrator. Uh, it's an hour long. It's available on YouTube today. We hope to be available on Amazon in the not too distant future. Uh, this film talks about four major threats to our power grid and we rely on electricity for virtually everything. And we are very complacent in this modern world, uh, thinking that uh, when we shut our refrigerator, it's gonna keep food cold. Uh, when we plug in our iPhone, we're going to be able to get power. Uh, we count on our municipal water system to provide fresh water. Uh, we count on everything electricity and our electricity utilities you know frankly have not done as good of a job as they should have done there's been regulatory capture which means the uh, 
industry essentially owns the regulators. And four major threats are a physical attack, a massive cyber attack, a, a EMP attack, electromagnetic disturbance, or a geomagnetic disturbance would all knock out uh, the power grid potentially for a long period of time. And if we don't have electricity in modern society, uh, the EMP commission was founded and it operated for 17 years at the behest of the U.S. Congress. And they found that as many as 90% of Americans would die if we don't have electricity on a nationwide basis for an extended period of time. Well, I mean, this this is this is mind-boggling stuff, and and the thing is, you've talked about. Uh, I mean, it could be a solar flare, it could be an EMP, as you talk about, and and we're pushing the envelope here at the moment, uh, David. I mean, this side of the pond, um, things are getting a bit tense um, with all the wars going on, and um, I think you know, probably the most logical. Um, a uh, logical form of attack would, would perhaps be an EMP. So you talk about the wars. We characterize this as being the most dangerous period of time that we've had since uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm. And essentially, we know we have Ukraine, Russia. Putin is furious at us for arming the Ukrainians. Uh, essentially, we have Hamas, Hezbollah. Iran, you know, teaming up against the United States and Israel, that's likely to come to another level after Ramadan ends. Uh, then we have China uh, versus Taiwan. And Xi has said he wants to go down in history as the most powerful, most successful leader in Chinese 5,000 years of history. Well, that's going to require him reunifying with Taiwan. And he's explicitly uh, uh, postulated that. Uh, you look at the fact that China has declared a people's war against the United States back in 2019. And therefore, we have essentially three theaters of war. And you combine that with our open southern border. And there's all these stories and film footage of military age single men without families coming across carrying similar backpacks canteens etc and it doesn't require much magic imagination to uh, determine these very likely are likely to be sleeper cells that are poised to uh, obey orders that might come in uh, relative to critical civilian infrastructure in the united states yeah, no, this, this is something that we're, um, I mean, something that we're encountering globally as well. And, and I, I, I basically call it the weaponization of migration. Uh, and, um, and, and, and it really, there is no, I mean, there is no other p plausible um, explanation as to why uh, one would allow, um, uh, you know, when, when you have passports, you and I need a passport, um, for me to visit to the U.S., I require visas. I need a, a full check of my background. And yet, as you just say, uh, in this country, we see it with people just arriving on boats. We don't know who they are. Single men um, of, 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 of fighting age. Um, you, 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 far worse from what I see um, in, in the States because you're talking about how many, how many, how many, Hundreds of thousands of people have entered um, the, 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 the U.S. without any kind of checks whatsoever. So I think the number that's come across has been 7 million. Wow. And there are some kind of checks, but there, there are a lot of people that are not having any checks and certainly are, uh, we've essentially impeached uh Secretary of Homeland Security, uh, Mayorkas, you know, because his lack of, you know, uh, doing the right thing for Homeland Security. And we essentially have a nation 
uh, with an open border. And let's just pray that we get through this. Well, I understand that um, that th- there has been um, that that obviously you have an election coming up, and there's quite distinctly two sides, uh, two completely different polar opposite views on on this process, and um, and then you, you've got uh, Trump uh, very likely leading uh, leading the way here, and and it may be that um, he gets in, or maybe it isn't. Um, but I th- understand that if he does does get in, um, it's made, he made quite a statement uh, that he would actually immediately shut the border and he would immediately start deporting um, people. And um, do, is, is that viable? Do you think that would happen? I think that is probably his most likely cause of action. And I, I would like to, to say that my movie is truly bipartisan and I did bring out one of the threat vectors being the open border, which is more of a uh, partisan issue. I'm not sure why it is, but if, if you uh, eliminate that issue, our uh, position is that we need to protect our critical civilian infrastructure. And that is as bipartisan as it gets. And in fact, our film talks about in 2018, the California legislature that is dominated by Democrats passed unanimously two pieces of legislation imploring U.S. Congress and the U.S. president to protect our grid against EMP and GMD. So, you know, we always have to think, okay, well, well, obviously this is all about education. This is all about providing information to people so they can make uh, their own decisions and hopefully make um, better decisions for themselves. Um, And so the first thing um, that pops into my mind is, I mean, should should you you do have this worst case scenario and the power grid goes down, you can't just refire a power grid, can you? It just you just cannot just restart it. Um, What kind of time period would I mean, depending on 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 the uh, the way it went down, but but it's certainly, you wouldn't be able to just switch it back on. So would you be talking about weeks or months? Well, there we're getting into very complex subjects. There's something called a black start. And if all the power grid goes down and uh, there are, you know, uh, mechanisms and uh, procedures to do a black start, but it is highly risky. It is highly kind of theoretical at this point how we do it. And it has not really been tested. Uh, But one of the issues we talk about in the film is the vulnerability of our high voltage transformers. And these transformers, you know, uh, weigh several hundred tons each. And they are manufactured largely abroad. We have very small domestic manufacturing uh, capability in the, in the United States. And there is a backlog uh, currently of four to six years for these high voltage transformers. So let, let's say the grid's not down completely, uh, but our transformers are out you know, then, uh, and can't be replaced. We, we could be at a nationwide power outage for a significant period of time. And frankly, people have talked about it coming back in nine months. The thing is people aren't going to be working. They are going to be going into the transformer shop. They're going to be, you know, at home, you know, with an AR 15, whatever food they have left trying to protect their families. And therefore, it's hard to say how quickly if we'll come back at all. So when I was living um, on the, um, in the, in the, on the West Coast um, in in Vancouver, um, it was quite common for people to put um, earthquake supplies away. Um, You know, um, waterproof containers, it was just logical that, look, you know, you don't know. One day you could wake up. It's, it's happened. Um, 
And uh, I think I remember very, very strongly in uh, what we were, were doing was obviously we, you put in what we'll keep and you try and build something that will get you through a period of time at the very least. Uh, unfortunately, in, in, when we were, you know, weren't armed um, but to, to protect those things, but um, which I th- understand that you might have to do. But the, the other thing that we, we needed to do was make sure we had some gold coins and, and silver coins because that would have then been the only form of barter. Because really, as I know, David, you, you're, you're the one that you, you've been talking about this for uh, as long as I can remember, um, that basically when you look at a gold or a silver coin or bar, all the energy that was ever required to make it is in it. It's actually already existing in it. So therefore, um, it has no counterparty risk. Therefore, it becomes the ultimate bargaining, the ultimate barter tool. Uh, it could be to get somebody to dig a trench. You, you, you can measure the labor uh, to, to, to take a chicken or to buy a chicken or, or, or whatever it might be, or even to buy yourself passage on a ship somewhere. Um, to get out of a situation. Um, so so it's interesting to me that this, what you're talking about, surely that must be a very similar, what do you, adv- I mean, obviously you can't advise people to do, but, but, but what would you suggest people do to, to, to prepare themselves for the worst case scenario? Well, frankly, they should have a, vault hole or a plan B, you know, option, because the problem is if the power goes out, it will be almost zombie apocalypse without the zombie. And uh, population density is your enemy in those kind of uh, scenarios. And you should have food and water and shelter and, you know, an arsenal and ammunition, frankly, and have a core group of people with hopefully some different skill sets and that you can get along with uh, to be able to survive. In terms of uh, barter, uh, agree that uh, this this will be gold and silver coins. You know, have provided great you know, barter functions uh, for thousands of years. And if if you're having to, uh, you know, swap, you know, your energy and your talents for something else that you want, uh, gold and silver, you know, has, has a great functionality there. Yeah. So, so really, really, this is, I mean, obviously one can't, um, you can't eliminate um, risks like this happening, but we can at least take steps. Take it's about personal responsibility, having your eyes open, not putting your head in the in the sand, and saying, "Well, okay, if this happens or that happens, um, really, I need to do what I what what I can do at least the very least I can do uh, to make sure my family." And, my, uh, and, and that we can survive as long as possible through a situation like this until perhaps a solution is found. But you also mentioned the social side here, which is interesting because you then, you talked about like-minded people getting together. You talked about um, sharing resources. Um, this is something that I would think would be how the most powerful way of getting through a situation like this, and to have a, 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 a you know, have a, a proper uh, structure uh, of people that you can trust. Exactly, and actually, I'm a investor, board member, and a joint venture partner of a entity that uh, was designed to provide, you know, this bolt hole plan B type option in the country for uh, individuals in the United States. So we we don't have a reach to the UK at this point, but people need to be 
considering all kind of options. And I hope and pray I'm wrong, but you know, I'm a probability guy. I'm a trade-offs guy. And I look at some of these you know, explicit statements that have been made by Xi and Putin and uh, North Korea's chairman. And uh, Americans are hated, really, uh, around the world by a bunch of bad guys. And they uh, despise our American hegemony. Yeah, and, and I mean, hey, understandably, hegemony comes and goes. It, 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 it moves. I mean, and you, when you think about it, to me, to me, when impartially, just completely impartially, what we're dealing with is um, when we look at the BRICS members, um, we're looking at the global south versus this 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 side of of of, of the of well, not the pond this side of the of the of the universe. Um, what we're looking at is a group of um, countries that don't really want to be in control of anything. They want to amalgamate all of their resources and have a free trade, borderless um, situation. It's not communism. This is this is to do with this is actually capitalism, but in its best form. Because um, so, for example, um, the BRICS current BRICS ten are meeting next month, and this is the first big meeting where uh, we understand. Uh, the white the Glasnevsk white paper has just been green lighted, and it's going to introduce two currencies. One is related to an SDE. Ah, well, yeah. I mean, that's going to take a long time to get involved because obviously foreign currencies, different volumes. It, it's going to be a very difficult process. However, the second currency and the the lion's share of the of what's going to happen, it's going to come through. As Glazyev's second option is a commodity, gold-backed commodity currency, where you can now um, literally digitize it, and uh, you can then it's on the blockchain, and you can create a currency where, and and bearing in mind that we're talking these guys control between these gr BRICS ten uh, and growing in Indonesia. Nigeria, all of these countries are beginning to to wake up to the fact. Hang on, this is a solution for us. So, so basically, what they're saying is, well, we, we can actually we can we between us we control or consume the bulk of the energy and oil trades, either providing it or using it, and therefore that is a multi-trillion-dollar market. Now, if you suddenly make it tradable. As a commodity, or even grains, or whatever it might be that you have resources of, and you, you don't need the West. You don't need the West. You have a currency where you can exchange this, but the West needs it. And this is a scary thought because if you suddenly price oil in gold, I mean, what is the price of oil in gold? I mean, goodness me. I mean, it isn't just eighty bucks. Because eighty bucks might buy you a, a barrel of oil now, but if you price that in gold and a quality hard currency like commodities, an amalgamation, what is the real price in dollars terms? It could be three, four, five times that. But yet the guys who have the gold, to them it is just a trade. I interesting thoughts, David. So let's talk about that just for a second. Andy, I talked about American hegemony and the fact that we have operated with the dollar being the world's reserve currency for a number of years. And the BRIC uh, nations and leadership have railed against, you know, how bad that is for emerging markets. And frankly, it has been. And we uh, talk about the fact the dollar has been you know, the most attractive currency because it's the least dirty shirt and the laundry hamper. But uh, we frankly have a dysfunctional global monetary system, I think. And, and I think a lot of experts would, you know, concur with that view. And uh, the BRIC nations, you know, and that 
group it just expanded by five, I guess, just in the last couple months. Yeah. And now the Russian guy is the, the new chairman of that group. And uh, so there's been this behind the scenes, you know, discussions we know, you know, between the brick nations about trying to, you know, do something about this dysfunctional uh, global dollar based system. And we do believe, you know, somehow it's going to get back to gold and other commodities. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, when you think about it, it suddenly makes sense because, um, when you think that, and, and, and again, we, we, we're very close, as you know, we're very close to the wholesale markets, very understand uh, a lot of what's going on uh, on, the, on the wholesale markets themselves. And we, we, we're, we're very confident in saying that China's real gold reserves are closer to 40,000 tons. Um, Russia's probably 20,000 tons. And the Chinese citizens themselves own 20,000 tons. Now, you've got, you can, in a warlike condition, and Z has said himself, and he walks around with a copy of a copy of um, the Art of War in his back pocket, um, and and basically, you, you, if if a push comes to shove, they can consolidate that resource to back this currency, and in a warlike situation, you can bring in and and, and we've even seen the plan. They announced the plan, which is. What we would do is we could even lease um, the, the, the we could take possession of uh, of the citizens twenty thousand tons, and provide a really beneficial lease return on it. And it wouldn't be like your reg- the, the kind of leases that we have over here, where where you're trying to suppress a price and and you're selling it into the market and you hope like hell you can buy it back. This is about putting resources together. Now, when you when you compare that to the, take the U.S. for a minute. Eight thousand one hundred thirty-three tons of what, what we are certain, given just empirical evidence, says it's rehypothecated. Because I mean, good God, if uh, when when um, when Germany wanted to repatriate just three hundred tons, it was going to take seven years. I mean, they wouldn't even let the German Bundesbank in to look at the vaults. So, so we have to assume. There's very little gold, real gold, that's unencumbered in America. Yet you've got all this gold to back a currency that is definitely going to. And people underestimate the the, the degree of de-dollarization that's going to provide. Exactly, and uh, my uh, geopolitical and uh, monetary knowledge pales to yours. Andrew, and so I know that this is something you've studied a lot, and your viewers and listeners that get to watch, you know, behind the vault, you know, are, you know, extremely lucky to have you help guide them through all this. Well, it, it again, we're just we're just trying to open people's eyes. This is again, this is why it's so important to have uh, the likes of yourself come on and provide, you know, the 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 more pieces of the jigsaw, um, and and then we assemble these pieces of the jigsaw together. And um, now you mentioned this this um, company or this that you've formed a company which is addressing um, the potential social side of perhaps, um, uh, or, or in the case of of the worst case situation, how do people access that? How can people possibly access that? Yeah, so it's called Fortitude Ranch, and our website is fortituderanch.com, and it is headed up by you know an amazing patriot who was a Air Force Academy grad, uh, as his PhD from Harvard. He did his dissertation on how to prepare NATO troops against fallout. Uh, he advised David Petraeus one on one in Iraq. And so we have seven uh, ranches in various states across the nation. And it's a little bit like a country club model. And you can have a room, you know, with a, you know, toilet and a sink or actually a more Spartan room. But you can have your 
family all show up there and in your room, you could have stored your key pharmaceuticals and your favorite scotch whiskey and your eyeglasses, you know, and, and you would be ready to go. And, you know, people are going to be put to work, you know, when we're there because it'll be survival. But we should have a uh, diversity of skill sets, you know, on those ranches such that uh, hopefully we'll have a dentist and a doctor and you know some spiritual you know professionals and you know we'll try to get through this this is fantastic information i had no idea about this david uh, when we spoke last time i had no idea i think this is opening a lot of people's eyes so i can just imagine in a situation um like that um if you're taking this kind of prep um uh, these the this this would also provide you security because obviously what you've one of the things you've just said is like if you're on your own and you've got um you've got people coming to take what food you have because they haven't stored it um then at least you'd be as you say you'd have a degree of security that you could never really have uh, have, have got on your own and I, I would encourage people and I'm going to go <laughs> have a look at it even though I'm not based in the US but it's the kind of thing that might spark um other people to do something similar uh what a great idea um david and you're are you is this are you a founder of this uh no i came onto it uh later but uh dr drew miller is the founder and he had he's a real patriot he has his heart in the right spot and he wanted to provide a infrastructure where uh more modest means uh individuals you know could ha have a place to go and we we hear stories about you know bill gates you know all the rich tech entrepreneurs have their hideouts etc you know and underground and you know more modest uh, means individuals need an option and that's what this is provide well i think one of the other things that um that I've I've followed you over many of the years is um, it takes a lot of skills to be a short seller, and to be a short seller, you have to be a quite a different person. You have to. This is not the natural order of things for most people. They just simply think you have to buy something to sell it. Are Are you saying I have to have a screw loose? What's it probably? No, be? no. I used to watch you on on the as i say on cnbc on a regular basis upsetting them very much upsetting them uh, and saying you're bearish on this and you're bearish on that and always promoting gold in, in every instance but but as a as a as a as a, a an absolute a expert what i mean really um talk about skill set to recognize to to be a short seller you have to be pretty savvy um and when it comes to and, and you know what to look for, etc. But when it comes to gold and silver, David, um, is there are the short sellers have been the likes of the U.S. Fed. But here's the problem: every other central bank globally, including the Bank of International Settlements, when they made gold a first-tier asset class, and uh, not not COMEX gold. But every other, but foreign exchange gold. So if if I'm a liquidity provider for the multi-trillion-dollar FX gold market, as of the first of January 2023, I had to have the bullion there. I had to have it. Now the only central bank still fighting the price of gold. Every other central bank is buying gold, and there's no doubt about that. Not just what's on the record, but monetary gold. You don't have to report it, and we we know that monetary gold is exiting and going into central bank uh, coffers, and it doesn't have to be reported at all. So now you've got the Fed. Now, as a short seller, you're thinking this. Okay, as a short seller, what essentially the Fed is the only short seller of gold on the planet Earth right now. How can this end when every single central bank is buying gold? Do you think, I mean, I have ideas on this, but do you think 
that they may have to find something else to fight the, 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 the war of the dollar being benchmarked by something they cannot control because you have to have physical to deliver it. Mm -hmm. Are they going to, now that they've sanctioned Bitcoin ETFs, for example, um, can they bring that volatility and gaming into what is a na another competitor to the dollar, which you can just print your way out of as opposed to trying to find physical to deliver? What, what are your thoughts? This is just what I'm seeing. Well, I am following Bitcoin not super closely, but I've been worried about you know Bitcoin uh, being really backed by nothing. And certainly there's finite supply that people are excited about. And here we are nearing 100,000. Although we had a flash crash yesterday with some fear about Tether you know, which is the biggest stable coin. And so I'm a big believer that there's a m massive problem with Tether. And Tether is essentially the money market fund for, you know, the crypto world. And, you know, Tether is still not audited and they're utilizing something called attestations. And along with a number of other professionals were saying, let's have a damn audit. And JP Morgan has been talking recently about the risk to the entire crypto market from the lack of transparency and the lack of, you know, really compliance from Tether. And George Noble and Grant Williams and, uh, Another gentleman, you know, have been talking for a while about the fact that this tether almost counterfeiting might have contributed to the recent price increases in Bitcoin. And therefore, I, uh, I'm, I'm quite concerned about this. Very interesting stuff. I had thought of that. Uh, this, is, this is, again, something to bend into into the equation this constantly evolving equation um but i, I think you know because let's face it um uh, uh, after two years three years after um nixon took gold off the gold standard um and, and the comex which was already trading uh, also vended in gold and it was pretty openly discussed at the time well what we can do is create a lot of volatility we can create synthetic supply uh, we can control uh, because obviously it had to find a way of stopping people <laughs> exchanging their dollars for gold at, at 35 bucks and whatever it was. So, so I mean, uh, which is iron ironically, it's what we're seeing now. <laughs> but but they're willing to pay a lot more because when you when you when you weigh out the whole picture, um, it's actually cheaper now in relative terms than it was then. So. So it's really interesting to me that this is this is now almost full circle uh, back to where we were. But the because the COMEX was created to control uh, gold, it wouldn't surprise me that the whole reason the Bitcoin ETFs were sanctioned to trade, that it wouldn't be a good way, a good mechanism to also, uh, because it's compete, look, we're talking about another thing that is competing against the dollar. It, in other words, Bitcoin is benchmarking itself against the dollar. Gold always has benchmarked itself against the dollar. So to me, when you suddenly see uh, a rogue trader sell 400 uh, Bitcoins in less than an hour, that to me was like, hey, hey, I've seen this rodeo before, but it was gold. So I wouldn't be surprised. It would not surprise me in the least if, because now, whereas Bitcoin, you can't know who's behind it, but you sure as hell know uh, the stops of the ETF holders. And so you could definitely, with position concentration, which is how they've always controlled everything with position concentration in a siloed market, uh, you can actually... To me, this is interesting. I, I mean, to me, I'm, I'm only just really beginning to get onto this gig because 
I'm very suspicious. I'm saying it may not be the case, but I'm very suspicious. And it wouldn't surprise me if um, there, as you say, and, and combined with what you've just said, a, there could be a big problem. There could be. And uh, this is going to be an, an interesting world uh, over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, Patrick Bet David, you know, was recently quoted saying 2024 is going to be the year of chaos. And I think on the geopolitical front, in terms of where we are with Russia and China and their two adversaries, the, the fact that China's economy is in dire, dire straits and, and the fact that we have, you know, Chinese uh, demographics, you know, you know, being in a horrific position. And then the fact that we have on the geocurrency, you know, a perspective where the bricks have doubled and, you know, the bricks are, you know, very, you know, opposed to U.S. dollar hegemony and this gold-backed, you know, central system. Here we had gold uh, break through $2,000 dollars where it seemed like there'd been a uh whenever bullion reached two thousand dollars it was knocked back down and i know you and i are both believers in gold suppression and we're both personal friends with bill murphy who runs gata and so i think he has been right on but here we've had gold you know surpass two thousand and then it stayed there and it went through 2100 it's gone through 2150 and it seems like there's a sovereign bid you know underneath the gold price that is not letting it fall and an area that we love is uh precious metals miners because these companies are selling at enormously cheap valuations today and, you know, with the price of, you know, production, you know, between probably 1300 and 1600 a lot of money is being made by these miners at 2150 And that's been another specialty of yours. Um, many, many, many years is, is um, uh, gold miners. And um, I know you've had structures set around them that have been very sophisticated structures set around them. Um, so can you tell us what you're, what, what are you doing? Because you mentioned your co a company that um, you, you head up, which actually really um, looks at that trade. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that, David? So I've partnered with a gentleman, Garrick Moran, based in North Carolina. And so he's really a uh, great mining analyst that's, uh, you know, uh, involved in tearing apart these companies and on every conference call, you know, over the last 20 years. And we like the uh, junior producers today because you don't really need to take exploration risk uh, because, but even Newmont is uh, one of the seniors is extraordinarily cheap today. And we think that uh, the mining companies are going to go through the roof and there are decades when uh, mining companies, precious metals mining companies do extraordinarily well, uh, the 30s, the 70s, and the 00s. And so I made a lot of money in Prudent Bear Fund between 2003 to 2008, you know, where we invested in mining companies. And that helped me offset some of the losses that the port portfolios suffered from being short stocks because mining stocks probably went up, you know, 600 some percent, you know, over that period. And we're going to have a period like that again. And these mining companies are selling at such cheap valuations in terms of price to cash flow, price to sales, even price to uh, gap oriented uh, PE ratios. Is that purely an institutional service or can people come and visit and 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 come and in, in, invest with with that company no in, individuals uh can find us i'm on linkedin 
and you can, you know, learn about, you know, our uh, options there for sure. That's really interesting. Um, and I guess I'm just gonna, what the, I, one, of, one of the last things I, I was going to cover is, is that Texas was one of the leading states uh, that wanted to repatriate gold, wanted to make uh, gold, uh, create, recreate gold as money. And there's a big um, movement at the moment in the, in the states, um, sound money movement. And I noticed I saw, the other day I saw Wisconsin was the latest state uh, to end state taxes and on gold and silver. But I, I'm a, but, but Texas led the way here. Uh, um, c- can you tell us what you're seeing about this sound money movement? Because obviously you're on that side of the pond. I hear a bit, but I really don't know an awful lot. All right. So a group out of Dallas, uh, which is Economic War Room, and I would encourage your listeners and viewers to go there. Kevin Freeman and Mike Carter are the two principals there, and they are actually working on a uh, gold-backed uh, currency. You know, utilize. And we have the Texas Bullion Depository. You know, outside of Austin, and these gentlemen are working with other state legislators, etc. So. They have been talking about, you know, this uh, state backed, you know, where you could have an account, you know, with gold and you would be able to, you know, have a credit card to be able to make transactions just with your gold account. Mm -hmm. And I wish I was you know, better prepared to articulate this better, but I'd love you to have Kevin or Mike on your program. They would be, you know, great guests. Yeah, exactly. I can see some partnerships there that, that would be opportunities. Um, because that's something we're way down the road on and, uh, you need facilities, backups, infrastructure for that. So it'd be great. I will do. And if you uh, mention to them, um, then, uh, we'll, we'll definitely contact them and, and have a chat about, you know, coming on and, talking about their work and I'm sure that blends in with I mean there's a huge social side to what we're doing all of us are doing here and we're bringing um you know we're bringing sound money back um into the forefront and and it really pleases me to see uh states in America uh and more and more and more will 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 do this uh to actually re-monetizing gold and silver and obviously then you need a mechanism to make it trade but um, but this, this is a process, and, and I think really encourages me to see that, David. And, and um, I, I, this is something that I, I, I welcome. This is it takes it actually takes Americans to do this. It takes because they have. I, honestly, I, I, I often say this side of the pond, people are apathetic about these kind of things. It takes real drive. It takes and and when you've got a state behind you, and when you've got states doing stuff like this, it's encouraging. You involves gets people to invo- involve. So I see this as a really strong, strong um, movement uh, that is going to be the only thing that offsets uh, what your government, the U.S. Fed, is doing right now, which is opposing the, the the rise in the price of gold or attempting to. And seeing, I see them giving up. I, I see them absolutely giving up when every other central bank on the planet Earth is is is, is buying gold. Hence, the price will keep going up, and it has been puzzling. Even Bloomberg, I have Bloomberg on a lot of the time, and they finally worked out. They were puzzling. Well, how come the ETFs are go- are going down, and the gold price is going up? Well, because you're losing all the paper money. Nobody, these CTAs that have been trading paper, paper gold, but literally are bailing. Uh, and, and, you know, they've got other things to play with, like Bitcoin ETFs and one thing and another. But while they were selling their ETF holdings, the price of gold's going up. And finally, they woke up, I think about a week ago, somebody on Bloomberg said, hey, this has to be central bank buying. Go no no shit Sherlock I mean honestly <laughs> um, 
But I mean, that's what's happening. So I think um, it's good that that what is happening your side of the pond is offsetting a lot of what this idiot Fed is doing in trying to oppose the price of gold rising when they should be on board. The Bank of International Settlements already, the, the central bank of all central banks already made gold Basel III compliant. Why? It's a first year asset class. Why? I mean, suddenly it's being used when it sell on the, says on the box. On the box it says it, it, it's, it's a real asset hedge, you know, so which is something you purported long before anyone ever said it. Um, and so you've got this side of the, Everything this side of the of the pond um, bullish for gold, and, and you've got to me it's mind boggling that um, the only negative um, view on gold is still the um, I guess in a in a protect in an attempt to 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 protect declining hegemony. Um, maybe that's the reason. Well put. So it's these guys, Kevin and Michael, are phenomenal patriots and they are working state by state and there has been a great deal of reception for this and uh, people are going to be able to get you know a gold backed credit card you know and and have and there are certain tax advantages for this and again i can't wait for you to have these gentlemen on definitely going to do it Definitely going to do it, David. Look, I could I could spend the next three hours with you. I'm I am coming back to Texas. We had a great a blast when I was there with you last time. Uh, you introduced me to some real Texas lifestyles there. I mean, a steak when it, it has to be this thick, and and you know what I mean. So we 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 had we 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 we, had, we broke some bread. I want to come back when I do this? Um, we're going to talk a lot about gold, silver and um and sound money and um thank you so much for all you bring to the table and i'm going to encourage people to uh, all your links will be put on the uh, below this episode i really do encourage people to land on it uh look at the movie uh look at some of the things you talked about blew my mind today like i had no idea that you were putting together uh, these these uh, social the social side of this as well um but thank you for all you do and um i really look forward to um you joining us again because it's been a year and and it was too long <laughs> i so look forward to that andrew look forward to breaking bread with you here and then uh Thanks for that reach out about watching the film. So if I could encourage you, your viewers to become a grid warrior. And therefore, if you like the film, we have the ability to, where you can write letters and make phone calls. Now, I know you have listeners, viewers around the world, but your American viewers, especially to be able to write your U.S. regulators, legislators, members of board of directors, and then tell your friends, please tell 20, 30, 50 of your friends and tell them to tell 50 of their friends. That would really help me. Absolutely. And I'm going to, what I'm going to do is also um, look at some of those letters and maybe we can adapt them for this side of the pond as well, because we have all got the same problem here. Yeah. yeah. But thank you so much for joining us. Uh, bless you for joining us. And um, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Okay. Me too, Andy. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Andrew McGuire and special guest David Tice of Grid Down Power Up for another fascinating discussion. And remember, buy physical, buy physical, make sure it's one-to-one -one backed by physical, make sure it's insured also, and understand the difference between what Andy affectionately calls the casino paper gold and silver markets and the actual physical gold and silver markets they're not the same. We talk about it every week on the show here. Don't be fooled. And there you have it. That's all we have for you today on another fascinating episode of Live from the Vault. Now, please help keep spreading the word about this channel by hitting that like button. Not now, but right now. You know, share this information and subscribe if you're not already subscribed. And if you want to be notified in real time as each episode goes live, just hit that bell right there and you'll be notified. And with that, We'll see you next time on Live from the Vault. See you then.